this coronavirus is front and centre. How do you expect it to impact sales this year? Yeah, well, look, as we think about deliveries, let's think about that from a revenue perspective. Uh, we don't have aircraft delivering to China in the first uh, semester of 2020, uh, so it's not going to impact our guidance to the marketplace. In addition to that, uh, we don't have tier one suppliers. Uh, of course, we have tier two or sub suppliers in China. But right now, the guidance is as we talk to uh, the tier ones and they talk to the factories in China, we're not seeing any movement on what we expect to get out of China in terms of uh, inventory for this year. In terms of sales, um, look, for sure, there's very limited travel. I mean, when we think about travel going in and out of China right now, Haslinda, just to frame it up and give you some specifics, China equates to and accounts for 16% of global travel. That's in and out and within China. Since coronavirus has happened, 25% of the schedule has been brought down. However, what's going on on the ground is even more extreme. 50% of the operating flights have been cancelled. And that, that percentage may grow. So look, there's a lot of folks just simply not travelling, not only in China, but in Southeast Asia. Um, we're just hoping that we get through this in the next few weeks and get people on the road again. So having said that, John, I mean, is it even realistic to think that the aerospace sector will get back to growth in 2020? That has been the expectation. IATA, uh, the governing body uh, that most of the airlines around the world are a member of, forecasts for the Asia-Pacific region growth of 4.2% in 2020. That was a projection that was issued at the end of 2019. Overnight, the pundits, as they do a bottoms-up analysis looking at the travelling that's going on, they're now suggesting that that could turn into a negative 2 to a negative 6 or 8 percent. We simply, Haslinda, just don't know as we sit here today. But I think it's fair to say pragmatically that growth of up to 5 percent in the Asia-Pacific region, that's not going to happen in 2020. For Umbrea, it is a mulling of a turboprop aircraft, you know, a partnership with Boeing. Some say this is worth $4.2 billion. I mean, there's no number out there. And Umbrea has not given a number. Can you put a number to it? Well, the, uh, the $4.2 billion, that's the investment in cash that Embraer, uh, excuse me, that Boeing will be paying the Embraer shareholders uh, for the acquisition of 80% of commercial aviation at Embraer. That's the $4.2 billion. Uh, separately, the uh, aggregate investment that we're looking at making if we decide to go forward with the turboprop, a decision we'll make in the fourth quarter of this year, well, we haven't shared that with the market, but between what we would do, Haslinda, and what the engine manufacturers would do, it's a multi-billion dollar number. But it's not a number that my board has any appetite to take in the event the joint venture doesn't go ahead. So no Boeing, no Tabba prop. No, T, no JV, no TP. <laughs> What's the business case for it? It's very robust. When we look at, from what we've seen thus far, the two incumbents, particularly ATR, which is 50% owned by Airbus, and the Q400, which is now owned by a company called de Havilland in Canada. ATR has four-fifths of the market. And by anyone's estimate, Haslinda, that's an effective monopoly. Now, what's interesting is Airbus owns 50% of ATR. So park that for one side. Why I like the business case? Well, those two incumbents are flying platforms that are 30, 40 years old. Old technology, they're loud, they're noisy inside in the cabin, uh, they're burning a lot more fuel than they need to, they're just not comfortable. We have the capacity and capability to bring a disruptive new app, if you like, to the marketplace, a state-of-the-art turboprop. And by the way, we've been building turboprops consistently at Embraer for 50 years. Now, of course, in our defense business with the A29, the Super Tucano. So we know this technology, we know that we could bring something special to the market. We have a couple of more advisory boards that we need to do with airlines this year, and then we'll bring our, our final recommendation to the board, Q4. Uh, what we know is that this JV is still pending regulatory approval. Where are you with that? Well, we've made very good progress. There were 10 jurisdictions around the world, which included the United States, China, Brazil. I mentioned those, and Japan. I mentioned those jurisdictions because they all have their own domestic manufacturer. So we've now secured nine of the 10 uh, antitrust approvals. Not only that, Haslinda, but important to capture without any conditions. So unconditional approval from those nine. We're working now, of course, with the European Union, the Commission in Brussels, to uh, get the data that they need 
so that they're positioned to make their final ruling. Not there yet. Are you concerned? I mean, is there reason to be concerned? This is, you know, home of Airbus. Does that complicate anything? Well, look, as, as a proud European myself, uh, you know, I have the utmost uh, trust in the credibility of, of the Commission. I mean, the uh, Commissioner is looking at deals all the time. So I, I don't believe that the Airbus uh, being a domestic manufacturer in the EU uh, is going to influence this. The core point that the Commissioner and her team at the DG competition are looking at is, is there overlap in competition? Let me give you one interesting statistic. My smallest aircraft, uh, my, excuse me, my biggest aircraft, the 195E2, is 20% smaller than their smallest aircraft, the Mac 7. And the Mac 7, Haslinda, can fly 50% almost longer than the 195E2, my biggest aircraft. Those are the two key metrics that airlines look at. There's no overlap. This is a market that's been dominated by ATR for the longest time. How big a game changer will it be? On the turboprop side, uh, it will be a massive game changer. Uh, we actually believe that we could stimulate uh, ATR to make a move uh, and maybe generate their own new aircraft. So the winner here would be the customers because they want two competing platforms. The winner here also will be uh, the climate. We will bring to the market a, an aircraft that will less CO2 emissions, less noise emissions. So I, I expect if our move, our disruptive move, will force them to make a move as well. You know, John, I'm curious. I mean, have the European airlines given any feedback? What's been the reaction so far? There was a very big conference in Dublin at the start of uh, mid-January, as there is every year. And through the, uh, uh, through the course of the interviews that I was doing over there, some on stage and some bilateral interviews, uh, we were requested thereafter to get uh, some updates for the airlines. Airlines said, look, we need to figure out. We weren't aware you had gone to phase two. Please tell us what's going on. So, you know, in as much as we want to respect the integrity of the process, of course, with the Commission, so we're not divulging any uh, confidential information. But we did say, look, we're in a stage two of their analysis. Um, what the airlines want to do with that information uh, is up to them thereafter. But the airlines want clarity. They want to understand what the competitive dynamic is going forward. And right now, the competitive dynamic is distorted. It is favoring one party. I'm competing against the A220. I don't compete against the A320, and I don't compete against the MAX. The bid data clearly shows that. But I compete against the A220 that increasingly looks like it's going to be almost wholly owned by Airbus. So, Haslinda, in the battle, I'm fighting with, uh, with the hand knife, and they've got a bazooka coming around the corner. That's very, not fair. Very quickly, before I let you go, in terms of regional jets, the numbers that we're looking at for 2020 would be? In this region? Yes, in this region. Well, look, let me, the big, over the course of the next 20 years, we're looking at about 2,000 regional jets here. You're also looking at about 950 turboprops in this region. We haven't given the guidance what we're going to see in sales for this region this year, but it's, this is the biggest regional market in the world. It accounts for 28% of the deliveries over the course of the next 20 years. Europe is number two at 27% and the US is number three at 26%. So we're very focused on the opportunity here in Asia Pacific, not only today and this year, but over the course of the next couple of decades.